Live. We're live. That's the, yes, we are live. I think we're live. Um, it looks like it anyway. Well, welcome um, to another Facebook Live. And we're not time flies today. And I'm kind of glad. I, I just get to sit here and talk to Sean Combs. So um, that's going to be. It's going to be a little nicer. I don't have to tiny flies or do anything really other than ask you hard questions. Um, my guest today is Sean Combs, who is lead, lead product designer, rod designer. What is your official title, Sean? Uh, my official title is director of product design and development for Fish and Hunt at the Orvis Company. And my unofficial title is the uh, head product developer for rods and reels as well as the director for the other stuff. So I, uh, um, I get to work with a great team of designers and developers. And if you fish in it or hunt with it and it bears the Orvis name, then our team is responsible for bringing it to market. Mm -hmm. And you have some, some things that you're very proud of your team has developed. Many things. Yep. And, you know, um, I hope we're live. I don't see any comments. We're, we're live. Uh, Andy Miller says hi. Evan Bentley. Robert, oh. Um, Mr. Corbetta from Italy. Oh, I was, looking, I was looking at the wrong screen. Okay. Hi, That's guys. Right. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is I get I get constant constant um, emails and podcast questions and even Facebook Live during fly tying about about selecting a rod and um, one of the hardest things that people have to grasp is is which series do I buy, right? Because you, you can you can spend 150 bucks with Orvis for a complete fly rod outfit, 159, 149 for yep. an entire, or you can spend over a thousand dollars for a complete outfit, 800, eight, 900 dollars for a rod. And so I, I think that it'll be really helpful for people for you to talk through the various series that we have and what the what the cost value relationship is and you know what they get what they get for what they're spending because it's it's an expensive purchase and um, you know it's it's not something you take lightly you, you need to research it and people agonize over that understandably so so why don't we start at should we start at the top or the bottom Sean? I think we should start at the top. Um, okay. I mean, start you know, the top. basically our flagship rod series is uh, the Helios 3. Um, it's in its third generation. Uh, the Helios family started its journey in 2007. And, um, and it's been one innovation after another. And uh, we're really proud of it. But kind of digging in, I have people all the time that ask me, why is that fly rod, you know, why does it cost so much? And what are, do I really need that? And, um, you know, and I say that uh, I usually answer the first question is, why does it cost so much? You should take a tour of our factory or watch one of the videos online um, of the rod building process at the rod shop here in Manchester. And I think you'll have a better appreciation for the dedication, the craftsmanship, um, the hard work, the the material package, um, the, you know, the fit and finish and all the componentry that, uh, to add up to a great, uh, American made product that, you know, anyone, whether they're an angler or not should be proud of, you know, there's very few, um, really awesome American made products, um, and, you know, that are, that are celebrated at the, at the level by people, you know, and for anglers, um, the Helios 3 really um, is that, and it's pretty cool. It's the pinnacle for us of, geez, over 164 years of rod building. And that's, to me, that's probably the coolest thing about the H3 is it is, it is really um, kind of taking all that in, in history and learning and bringing it and 
into a modern design with modern materials and uh, and just creating a product that when you get on the water, you you fish better, you fish with more confidence. Um, you know, you we can break it down if you know what does fishing better mean. And I think that that means is enjoying your day on the water. It's not necessarily fish count, uh, but it's like a lack of frustration. It's a lack of, of, you know, worrying about can I make this cast and having the confidence and having the rod work for you to make the cast. And that's really what you're getting with an H3. A lot of people think that they need to be a pro or me to be, a, you know, the world's best caster to to use that rod but in reality tom and you know this you've seen it and you've talked to guides and you've seen um you know people casting the rod makes you a better caster um and that's really the hidden secret there that uh that i i really appreciate about the rod is regardless of what level you are uh if you're doing a reach cast to a tricky sipping fish or if you're just trying to you know get a cast a little bit further away from a drift boat um, it really helps you out and steps in and, and makes that experience that much better. And that's, that's really, when you pull all together, that's the reason uh, why H3s are so awesome. They sort of disappear. They come, become an extension of your arm. Um, and when it comes down to it, uh, I think what most people say, and I've watched a lot of people pick up the rod for the first time and fish it or cast it, is they turn around and they go, wow, this thing is so accurate. Um, you know, I, I was looking at this spot and it just right there. It's so accurate. And that's been probably hearing that feedback uh, and knowing that it's changing the way people are fishing. Uh, it's probably been the most rewarding part um, to to that kind of watching that the, the rod series evolve and and become uh, become what it is today. But why? Okay, you didn't say it was going to yeah. be easy today, right? Boy? No, I'm not going to be easy on you. And 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 you feel free to make one of your your fancy analogies that you love to use. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, really. Uh, why? It's the best yeah. People want to know why. Why is it better? Come on, Sean. Yep. Yep. It's the best fly rod because it's the most because. accurate fly rod. It yep. is. It is stronger than any rod in its weight class. Period. Um, it is it, from a from a accuracy standpoint, from a durability standpoint, the two most things that will keep you on the water and make you successful, it delivers in spades. And that's not just a hyperbole of, of me saying, you know, oh, it's the most accurate rod. That is us working with, uh, you know, working with high speed imagery to get the tip deflection during the casting stroke. Uh, to measure what its tracking is as it's casting and then how fast it recovers and comes back to steady state or it's damping. And, you know, measured against all the other rods on the market, uh, it delivers the results in the best tracking and most damp rod. Um, you know, when it comes to energy transfer and efficiency, uh, the rod is the real deal. And that's Ultimately, um, if you're serious about fishing and catching fish and enjoying your day uh, and everybody wants an advantage, uh, regardless of whether they're playing golf or driving a car, uh, that is that's why it's the best rod is it delivers on accuracy and um, and it delivers on durability. The other thing that's really nice about it is uh, when you think about rod design, you can you can kind of uh, play a game of compromise. So you're going to have the world's lightest rod. It might not be the world's strongest rod. You can have the world's uh, most accurate rod at 20 feet. It might not be at 60 feet. And, and H3 really, it is uh, a perfect balance, I think, from a product standpoint of delivering on uh, light swing weight, ease of casting, accuracy, durability. And then not to mention that when we got down into – the game of compromises we developed two sub series with the 3f and the 3d um, so that we could take one rod and maximize it and make it the best finesse rod or the most accurate and best finesse rod and then we you know the f series and then we could also have a rod that has zero compromise 
at distance casting, um, you know, for the 3D series. So I think that that whole package kind of together, um, you know, we can get to the how did we do it part. But that is if I'm walking into the store or if I'm stepping onto a, a guide's boat and, you know, I say I want to fish the best and I want to have, you know, the best day. Um, I want to have the most confidence in my in my equipment, um, you know. Our time is valuable when we're when we're kind of immersed in the outdoors and we don't want to be fumbling around with, you know, my boots are giving me blisters. Uh, my skis are you know, not performing. They're chattering around or this bike. It's really clunky. Uh, you know, you want you really want to maximize it. And that's when I think looking at a product like the H3, it's a zero compromise uh, product that's specifically designed and tuned for um, for purpose build applications uh, whether it be saltwater fishing for bonefish tarpon permit uh, or whether it be you know fishing to uh, really tricky picky fish on a spring creek somewhere um, with like a 9043 f um, they're, they're really fun series and i mean there's a lot more there and i'm ready for you to to bang me up and ask me uh ask me even harder questions yeah, you still haven't you still haven't answered what's in them. What's in them that does that? Come on. Oh, so you want to go what's before, in them? Before, right. let me pause you for a second. Um, there's a question here from Steve. What line weight should a beginner start with? Steve, if you could elaborate more. Uh, are, you, are you fishing? Are you are you in the eastern, western United States? Are you saltwater fishing? Are you bass fishing? Uh, then we can answer that question better. Okay, sorry. John, go yeah. ahead. No, Just no, want to no, make sure that we that we answer Steve's question uh, properly. There's there's some good questions in there. Um, I've got some I've got some backup here, Tom. I've got some buddies that came in and they I told them that you're going to be hard on me. Dave Jensen says accurate, not just on short leaders. Uh, the energy carries through the long leader as well. Uh, Taylor out in Colorado, he says H three equals tight loops for all. That's saying a lot. Um, something for a guy like myself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, Sean, 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 yeah. don't, don't rely on your buds there in the background. <laughs> I want to know what's in, what's the secret sauce in the age? Okay. All right. We'll break down the People want to know. People want to know this stuff, Sean. Yep. The secret sauce um, that really, so there's probably three secrets, secrets to the H3. Um, the first one is going to be the material. Uh, we use a proprietary thermoplastic high temperature cure resin system that uh, allows us to, to utilize the material package in a way that delivers more efficiency and energy transfer, makes a crisper rod, and also delivers a best-in-class uh, performance from a durability standpoint. That is the backbone, if you will, of, of uh, why is it special. The second one is our team of designers at the Rod Shop. You know, Frank Cord comes to mind. Um, there's a lot of people there, but Frank is really a wizard on uh, taking these load targets and profiles and making them where there's there's not a hiccup in the blank. There's not a flat spot. And that energy transfer, the tracking, the, you know, the straightness of which these rods track and how crisp and efficient they are and how they come back to zero you don't get at the end of the cast the the bobble and wobble, uh, which then translates into your line uh, losing energy and making it go wavy down towards the target, and then ultimately either tuck casting or flipping left or flipping right. Um, that is that's probably that would be our second secret weapon, and then the third is the number of hours that we've relentlessly. Um, just gone to the drawing board and tuned and tweaked construction techniques to increase hoop strength of the, of the blanks themselves. And I think you combine all that together. You have a proprietary material package. You have the skilled engineering and R and D of the rod shop. And then you take all of that and you put it together with the construction techniques that are making the structure, this, this really super complex spring you're making that structure where it is going to do one thing and that's deliver energy into the fly line directly and straightly and as straight as possible to a target um so at the end of the day you don't get that with recon you get some of that 
you don't get that with clear water. You get, you know, even less of it. But with H3, you get that um, maximized, you know, performance. And you get that in two choices with the F and the D. Did that do any better there, Tom? You got me on Yeah, um, I, we had a question here, which I think is a good one. Uh, without getting into any of your proprietary top secret things, um, how does hoop strength? Uh -oh. How, <laughs> oh, you're back. How does hoop strength um, play into this? I mean, we can't we can't really talk about how you got the increased hoop strength without increasing weight. But um, what what does hoop strength do for you, Sean? Hey, Tom. Yeah. I can hear you, Sean. I can see you and hear you. Sean. Uh oh. Sean. Hang on, guys. I'm going to get into the private chat here and tell him that that I can see and hear him. Oh, I can't see. I can't hear you. Okay, well, I'll tell Sorry. you, uh, we will. I can't hear Tom. They can't hear me. I can hear you. <sighs> Julia says she can hear both of us. Can you hear me? Nod your head. Yes. No. You're not moving. <sighs> They're so good. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Oh, I got you. Sorry. Okay. And, and uh, no one can see me. Well, that's okay. Just keep talking. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, so hoop strength. Where, where were we? Hoop strength. Hoop strength. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, through construction techniques, Tom, we uh, we were able to increase the hoop strength, and essentially, what hoop strength is is in the cross section of the uh, the fly rod itself. As you bend it, which rods naturally bend, they will either ovalize or they'll maintain their circular shape. When they ovalize, they're not necessarily ovalizing perfectly down the blank. They're mm -hmm. going to ovalize in different directions around uh, the cross section, if you will. And right. that kind of wonkiness creates the poor tracking uh, and also would lead to um, – that would also lead to uh, having, you know, the rod go through its kind of irregular path and at the end, you know, be bouncing around and all that. So – um, if you think about uh, the control there, you could have too much hoop strength. That would never, the rod would really never bend. It would One second. I think Julia's got it set up here where we got two of yeah. them. In. Roger Bird, oh. Julia is running this. So you know, Roger. Well, we're getting feedback from you now because I see two cones. Oh. There, that should be good. Can you hear me okay. now? Yeah, it's better. Yep, sounds good. Did you switch to your laptop? Sean? Yeah, perfect. Okay. okay, did you switch to your laptop? Yeah, I think I did. Okay. Okay. Thank I gave you. up on that. Sorry for the, sorry for the bouncing back and forth. Um, I think that we're good now because uh, everybody's got us, so... Uh, long story short, with hoop strength, that is essentially um, 
one of the biggest things that we sh that we shot for with um, with our construction technique studies that we did. You know, and when I say we did this, we spent probably the better part of three or thirty six months developing H three. So when you you know you kind of put yourself in the mindset, we launched H two in two thousand and twelve, um, and about two years later we started developing H3 and we really just uh, got down and dirty on, on, you know, asking why. And that's how we, we did a survey and asking uh, our pros and our customers what was most important. And they said accuracy. And that's really what led us down that path to, to focus on that. And then we started thinking about how do we make more accurate rods? How do we measure uh, tracking and damping? And that's really what's, sort of led us into the point where we are today. Okay. okay. Now, Kevin has an interesting question here. It says, I'm interested in the importance of the soft and hard spine of the rod, considering the fact that almost all casters cast off of the spine when their cast is observed. Yeah. That one? yeah, that's a really good question. So okay. um, it's not, Kevin, it's not so much uh, where the spine is in the rod. It's that the spine is aligned in the four sections of the rod. So what you don't want is you don't want a rod that the spine on set on the butt section is this way, you know, and say it's strong, if you will, in the circle, it's strong at three o'clock. And so, uh, you know, that would be with the off-handed open, uh, open wrist caster where the reel would be off to the side, that would be in its strong back. And then when you get to the butt mid, it rotates off of that. And then when you get to tip mid, it rotates off of that. And then the tip might be totally different. The reason why you want spine alignment is that the, the four parts work in unison to deliver the, the stress or the, the stiffness profile up and down the spine, up and down the blank uh, in unison. And here's first analogy is think about jumping on a trampoline where a quarter of the springs were stiffer than the next quarter and the next quarter. And so as you bounce on it, you're gonna get bounce over here and it's real stiff. You go over there and you go really far down and it's the same thing as you flex a rod um, and the rod itself, as it's bending through that, it doesn't wanna come back and then over and then back and then over. And it has to go through that kind of complex path. Uh, my little hand wave there is, is kind of demonstrating how you can imagine having those spines working against each other is not good. Hopefully that answers Kevin's question. Yeah. Um, one of the things about the H3s that um, that you haven't mentioned um, that, that make them a big advantage, and I believe it's the recons too now, is that the, the consistency of uh, the blanks and the ferrules and the various sections is so um, dead on that if someone breaks a tip section or a mid section, um, in the past, and I think with every other manufacturer, you have to send in the whole rod because the ferrules had a little bit of difference in them and they had to be hand fitted. Whereas now um, we are so consistent with the H3s and the recons, right? Yes. Yeah. The recons, that, um, that we can send you a tip or a tip mid or whatever and be absolutely certain that it's going gonna, it's gonna to fit your rod. Yeah. And send the whole rod back. Yeah. And to get there, Tom, um, I think, you know, if you walk through the rod shop uh, five years ago and you walk through it today, you'll notice a lot of new equipment. And we, we probably invested a right around one point seven million dollars um, in capital equipment expenditures to buy new cellophane machines with pivoting heads and very uh, variable tensioning um, capabilities. So. Uh, that we could match the taper of the blank uh, with the pivoting head of the cell machine. And, you know, it allows us to control uh, the pressure distribution down the blank before it's put in the oven. So that's, you know, that's one thing we have. Uh, we have sanders that sand at a much tighter tolerance. And uh, we were able really to, uh, for the first time with this capital investment is to build rods to blueprints. Uh, and not build rods to uh, kind of whittling it down until it fits right. And then each one's different. So um, that's been really awesome to see. And that's part of part of the performance uh, benefits. And one of the things that 
you'll notice there is the ferrule engagement is so much nicer and uh, so much more secure than uh, than it has been in previous generations of rods um, and and pretty much all rods in the industry for them from that standpoint. So Kevin is asking spine alignment creates better hoop strength. Well, not really. It just creates more continuity, right? Correct. Yeah. The hoop strength is uh, in the construction technique. And then spine alignment is where you're actually taking the blank sections and then deflecting it, measuring the spine, and then aligning it as you rotate it, aligning that spine from section to section so that the blank uh, has all the spines at 12 o'clock down the, down the spine of the uh, the rod itself. Right. And then I just want to answer a question. I can ask this one from Keto UV. For very big and, and wind resistant flies, like the ones we use for Golden Dorado, fishing using an uh, eight weight rod, do you prefer the D or the F? And I would absolutely say D for that situation. It just depends. Uh, yes, that's an, that's a, I would back you on that. Absolutely. Um, you better. It, I will. I will. Hey, you better. Point. Um, it, really, <laughs> uh, it depends because the, the AF, it depends on your style of casting. Um, and when you're talking about like uh, predator pounders and um, bigger flies, and that's like a four inch deer hair fly. When you think about that, going up to uh, rather large flies, um, having sometimes having a softer rod with a, a little bit longer stroke and slower stroke uh, with a really aggressively um, weight forward uh, fly line like the SA Igniter or our bank shot, um, you can you can kind of do it both. But if I were going on a Dorado trip tomorrow, I would have uh, a 3D, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's move on to the recon. W what? The recon's what 200 bucks cheaper uh no the recon is uh i'm gonna go with 350 dollars cheaper so the recon is a lot the recon's a lot cheaper it's still made in our rod shop still 100 percent vermont made um why and what what do you get in the h3 that you don't get in the recon yeah so uh first you get the most accurate rod uh, with an H3, you get uh, the energy transfer, that crisp action. You get a lighter swing weight rod that is going to be less fatigue all day casting. Um, when you go to a recon, some of the compromises that you're going to find uh, is that, well, first and foremost, you don't have the choices of 3F and 3D. So in like a 9 foot, a nine foot five weight, you're going to get a more all-purpose general profile uh, and, and load strategy in a performance rod there. Um, but the, you know, it really comes down to recons. We're able to make an American made rod and hit the price point by reducing the amount of investment in the material package itself. And, uh, that it's a, I'm not going to call it a cheap material package. Uh, it's just not as expensive as H3 thermoplastic high temperature cure resin system. Um, and, you know, and, and high modulus and uh, fiber package. And, and so, you know, I think that uh, that goes without saying. I mean, a lot of people like they, they scratch their head and they go, well, you know, geez, uh, you only put, what, a couple ounces of material in each rod? How could that really make a difference? Um, we buy that material by the pounds and it's super expensive. Um, so that does play a considerable amount into it. Um, we don't really cut corners from a fit and finish standpoint on the recons, but uh, where you'll see, you know, the cork's not as nice. Um, the, the guides, uh, the componentry is not as nice. And, but when you get down to how they fish, um, I think you're going to notice a heavier swing weight, a little lower, uh, uh, longer to respond, uh, not as crisp casting. And you're not going to have those purpose-built tools for finesse or distance. You're going to have a little bit more of a general purpose tool set. Um, you you really, if you go to a store and you put a eight weight 3D Helios and a Recon eight weight, um, and I always tell people, you know, okay, cast 
you you can cast the Helios first, or you can cast the Recon first. It doesn't really matter. You're going to notice the difference, and that difference really shines in uh, ease of casting to deliver that you know the longer cast, and then the accuracy. Some of the other subtle things, Tom, is uh, you know very subtle, and I would say not going to help you catch fish, but the H3 is coming in an aluminum rod tube. The recons come into a cloth rod tube. Both have rod sacks so that they can slip into carry it alls for travel, but um, little things like that that add up. But, uh, you know, both of them have quick rod identifiers. They, they look very similar, but uh, I, somebody asked me the other day, and the second analogy is, is uh geez that new ford ranger looks pretty awesome is it a ford raptor f-150 that costs sixty thousand dollars and it's like no and they're like why well it doesn't have a supercharged v8 with 500 horsepower you know and that's where the h3 really comes in and you have to pretty much have to drive that to uh, to get the sensation and the difference i mean you you know you fished recons and you fished h3s um i think you know the difference there Yep. Can, is it fair to say that there um, there's more complicated construction techniques in the H3, more oh, yeah. labor involved in the blind construction? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so the the recons use uh, some of the construction techniques that trickle down um, from H3, but they do it in a really general way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, like it's. Uh, it's taking some of the fundamental benefits and doing it with a, with a little bit of economy in mind. So you don't get, uh, and that's, that's really where that in combination with the material package itself is where you start to see the differences from a performance standpoint in the blank. Hey, Sean, a good question here from our friend, friend Todd Tanner um, on swing weight. Can you explain swing weight? For yes. those yes. of us who don't know much about it. Yep. I, I can. And I'll use my micrometers if uh, if you don't mind. So <clears throat> swing weight is where the mass of the rod is proportionate down the length of the blank, such that if you were to hold it on a pivot, um, how much counterbalance is required to keep it in, in line. So So it's where in the blank does the, the natural balance point of the rod sit? Um, we like it whenever, you know, with a, with a reel on, we like the swing weight to balance about an inch back from the end of the cork. And the reason for that is that's naturally where um, everything sort of works with your wrist and you don't, you know, you're not a heavy reel throwing around uh, and all that. But it's also when you're casting, uh, you have more control uh, with it. And so if taking the real out of the equation, because you, you could just say, Oh, well, you know, I could just put this big massive reel on, uh, and make the swing weight better. Well, then the physical weight would go up of your total system. So the swing weight is the balanced weight of the rod alone and where it is proportionately, um, along from the butt section up. And we measure that by balancing the rod in the same place. And then, holding it down. So let me get my, I'll do it this way. So we are holding it down here and with my hand, how much force uh, is required to balance it and keep it up. So what's the tipping point or tipping weight, if you will. Um, and what that is from a benefit to the caster is they're going not to be waving this big, heavy stick around, um, you know, and focusing on that. And they're basically going to be making much more delicate uh, motions with their arm to put the energy to the rod. Um, and it's, it's a big deal. Like if you've ever, if you ever, um, want to see what a kind of a poor swing weight rod is, and, and I'm not saying that this is how you should fish, but if you just tape a penny to the tip top of your rod and go out and cast it, uh, and you see the over travel of the tip of the rod and kind of the weight moving around, the stop and start of your cast, um, you'll understand what swing weight is and how it feels in your hand a lot better. When you pick up two rods, uh, the first thing people do at the wall is they pick it up and they wiggle and they go, oh, wow, that's so light. 
that's the sensation of the swing weight, uh, holding it out at a, like a 20 degree angle and kind of doing this motion versus physical weight, which is be just picking it up and holding it like this. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think that an eighth of an ounce in physical weight is less, um, less perceived, uh, whenever you're casting and fishing than, than, you know, a couple grams in uh, swing weight, you know, so that's why we've focused on making lighter and lighter swing weight rods. Here's another related question. Beyond fatigue, does swing weight impact casts? It does. Yeah. Uh, Brian, it's a good question. Um, just, just because if you had a very tip heavy rod uh, and you ended your cast, the, the, the weight of the tip would continue to travel and it would require the rod to have more time through its resonance uh, to come back to steady state. If you have less mass out there, that spring mass damping equation, the, the tip itself will, will more than likely come back to steady state. And that means that all the energy goes into delivering the fly line, putting the energy into the fly line to increase its velocity, and then not wavering around at the end of the cast. Um, if you ever watch somebody casting, on the side of the bank and you see this big sine wave going down their fly line, that's because their tip at the end of the cast is bouncing around or their shaky hands. Um, okay. If you watch a really good caster, you can, you know, like Pete's a great one. Pete Kutzer is a great person and I love watching him cast new prototypes because he's so smooth. Um, he's not putting a lot of the shaky into the rod. The rod is, and I can really see tip bounce versus a damp tip. And, Really, that's what led us down the path of let's use high-speed cameras um, to calculate what that deflection is and how fast they recover and how much they track. Because you know, my eyes can only um, take so much data in. You know, when Pete's casting, but if we mounted the rod static and then started measuring that that uh, tip bounce and tracking, and uh, we're able to really adjust things and make better rods from that standpoint. Here's another good question from Kevin. How does paint a rod affect performance versus a plain blank? I've noticed many, many manufacturers painting their entire rod. Well, most people have forever. Yeah, I mean, since the and some sort of paint, some sort of paint or resin. Yeah, there's a there's definitely whether it's a, a tinted clear paint, but most manufacturers are sanding and uh, and painting rods. And so a couple things there. Uh, I think that. Uh, paint offers, uh, uh, well, one, it, it offers low glare because we're using matte paint on H3s and on recons. And so that was part of feedback from, uh, from field testers and from pros is that we, you know, glare is an issue whenever you're permit fishing on a flat or whether you're trout fishing on a really tight quarter of Spring Creek. And, um, but from a, how does it affect the, it, it probably is going to increase the durability a little bit from an impact resistance standpoint. You know, these are, um, you know, it's also going to help as a UV protectant barrier to breaking down the rod, the resin in the rod. So I'd say it's going to increase longevity of the product itself. Um, those are two kind of off the topic, uh, off the top of my head. And the mm -hmm. other thing, uh, our matte paint, that we're using one of the reasons another reason we went to matt is we're getting better feral engagement um as light as it is the texture on the paint has really helped increase and you kind of have to get down with a you know a microscope and think about the surface texture instead of being a smooth um you know carbon resin finish where it allows you know some uh lower friction state for it to twist and loosen up. This has got like a little bit of a, 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 you know, microns of layers of paint that are kind of compressing a little bit and giving you a better fit. And that's one of the reasons why for H3, we decided not to do one piece rods is because in field testing, we had such improved ferrule engagement and uh, zero slippage that we really didn't need to eliminate the ferrule anymore. We could go back to having travel rods. Here's another good. Oh. Yep. Yeah. I'm there. 
Are two piece rods better than four piece? Uh, I don't, I don't think so personally. Um, I think that once you put one ferrule in, you know, you might as well put three. And one of the nice things about four piece rod, aside from the convenience of travel is from a designer standpoint, it gives you four different discrete sections to change the internal diameter taper of the rod, which allows you to do a lot more with the profile of the rod itself. Um, that was the most challenging thing with H2 one piece is we had a straight taper on the, the uh, blank itself from tip to butt section. And so whatever that was, if it was 375,000, you know, inch per inch of decrease or increase in diameter from tip to butt, that was what it set. Uh, once you set up and you have four pieces, then you can have a soft, supple tip um, that's still durable, a shallower taper, uh, maintains impact resistance for split shot, but also has a really supple like tip and tip mid that will protect light tippet. And then you can then ramp it up and do a nonlinear taper strategy um, and get you know faster tapers in the butt mid and the butt section so you have a lot of backbone in a rod. So I, I prefer from a designer's choice, um, I prefer to to straight up go with uh, four piece rods. And ferals and feral design and the and the and the taper design are so good these days that you don't really it's not like you have a dead spot there. It's not yeah. No, that's uh we we do a lot to measure uh what I would call the profile along the blank and how the arc of the curvature is from butt to tip section. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of methodologies that basically we could take older rods from, uh, you know, 20 years ago and you would see these big flat spots. Uh, back then, sure, having a two piece rod, you had only one flat spot instead of three. Uh, but these days we, we have a transfer of energy and strength throughout the rod that you kind of really pretty much don't see those ferrules at all in measurement. Do you want to answer what's what's the when is H4 coming out and what's the H3's future? More unique rods like a two weight or seven weight, new colors. You wanna? Yeah, uh, H3's future is you're probably gonna see um, some some unique colors in some models. So um, for those of you who got an opportunity to get one of our limited edition artist series rods over the holidays. With Tim Johnson's, uh, you know, hand uh, soldered, burnt in art on the cork, uh, those had blue and olive labels for the the three D and the three F five and, and eight weights, and uh, we like those so much that we're gonna run a limited batch of those uh, sometime this year, and then you, I think you're also gonna see expansion of uh, some models. Um, just based on the success of the series and people, you know, it only takes enough people to ask for a certain rod and we go, oh, okay, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll make that one. Um, so I think that's probably in there as well. Uh, I would always put my money on uh, us coming up with some, some fun uh, stuff around, you know, our flagship series. I mean, we'll celebrate it any chance we get. And uh, we, you know, I love stuff that's unique and, and different and I wouldn't say limited, but just uh, kind of different. And so, you know, like the covert series with H2, it's always fun to kind of surprise everybody um, with stuff. But, and as far as when, when is H4 coming? Uh, gee, I don't know. Um, <laughs> like, uh, you know, I'm, in, in some way uh, these rods are like our children. And uh, I just, right now I'm, I'm enjoying um, little league and, and seeing them hit home runs. And I'm not so sure I'm ready to think about the next one. There's a, that's my third Good analogy. analogy. Good. analogy. Hey, you know, um, one of the, one of the things that's, that's our philosophy at Orvis for rod design is that, um, is that we don't come out with a new series until we have a measurable improvement in performance. And sometimes that takes a while. Sometimes, um, it might be a material breakthrough or a construction breakthrough, and and we have to we have to be able to demonstrate a material fishing advantage when we come out. A new, we don't come out with a new series just because it's time for a new series and people want to buy a new rod as much as we'd like to. <laughs> we can't do that. Yeah, so there's uh, a couple. 
There's a couple on here, Tom, that I think. Is A3? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Ty, Ty wants to know if A3s are brittle in the cold. Uh, I think that the temperature range of uh, the resin system that's that are used in, in almost all fly rods are uh, they're broader than the, the temperature ranges that we fish in. Um, you know, and, and we'll say that we fish when a lot of people will fish whenever they have to take uh, the ice off their guides every third cast. And so uh, I don't think that they get brittle uh, whenever they cold from that standpoint, just looking at the, the resin packages uh, operating conditions um, and, and looking at the mechanics of the materials there. The, uh, if you think about it, that same material package, is used in the Black Hawk helicopters, um, actual wing itself. Uh, and so I don't think that the, uh, you know, the Department of Defense would be contracting Lockheed Martin to, to make helicopter blades that can't withstand, uh, you know, 10, 15 degrees air temp. So uh, one person real quick I wanted to hit on, uh, when are you bringing back Superfine Carbon? Um, speaking of their ch children analogy, uh, thanks, Joseph. The, uh, the Superfine Carbon and New Recon Series, you'll notice there's some short light line rods in there that are actually um, more Superfine Carbon DNA than they are anything else. And that sort of, uh, it's a good example of how we decided to design the Recon Series. Um, those seven and a half foot three, seven and a half foot four, uh, the eight foot four inch three weight, those rods are full flex rods. They're much lower. Um, and you're going to, you're going to find them to be very comparable to how superfine carbons behaved. Uh, when you get into the eight and a half foot four weights up to the, the nine foot six weight freshwater rods, those are very, uh, very much mid tip flex. If you were to take the old designations, but they're very much all purpose rods. They, uh, the style of that rod from a profile and load standpoint, stiffness is, is pretty much right in between a uh, Helios 3D and a 3F. So if you're sitting on the fence and you, you know, and, and you're like, man, this recon's really great, but I really want a rod that I can throw foam with a dropper out of a drift boat on a tailwater um, with a hundred percent confidence, then you probably want to step up to a, a 905 3D or a 906 3D. Um, and the same goes if you're, you know, sitting on a recon and you're wanting to have a, a really nice dry fly rod, you probably want to go to a 904, 905, 3F. So here's what I'm going to answer from Jay, best rod for alby fishing. So you, you might be tempted to fish a seven or an eight for albies because they're not huge. Um, but um, the problem is I've seen lots and lots of rods blow up alby fishing that don't have a, a good substantial butt section because when they get close to the boat, um, they sound and um, they're really, they do the tuna death circle and they're really tough to lift. So I would go at least a nine and I often use a 10 weight for LB fishing. So nine foot, nine weight, nine foot, 10 weight would be my choice. All right. Yep. Um, love it. We're getting a lot of people who are answering the questions for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thanks, everybody there. That's uh, it's good stuff. I really appreciate it. Um, one question that we got here is, who did the drawing on my hat? That's Paul Puckett. That's a saltwater cowboy. It's a raccoon on a tarpon from Flood Tide. Um, I was doing a little uh, shopping and supporting uh, supporting our industry, and decided to to uh, buy a hat from uh, Flood Tide last week. So. Uh, and I'm and I'm liking it. It's making it's giving me dreams and hopes of tarpon fishing sometime soon. Oh, here's a good one. Um, what will you notice a difference in casting and performance between the previous recon and the new one? I like that one. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's probably uh, the the biggest thing is not uh, is the new recon. How close is it to an H3? You know, H3 is still, I think, hands down. Uh, is, is still far and above any rod that's made. Um, but when you think about uh, the new recon compared to the old recon, um, there is a considerable difference in swing weight to the point where, you know, when we rolled out the rods uh, at IFTD, people were coming back over and they were like, wow, you know, geez, you did it again. And 
And you usually don't get that kind of uh, feedback from a mid price rod. You know, those usually are the sleepers that just do the hard work in the, in the series, but there's a lot of really awesome rods there. The, the two 10 foot um, European nymphing rods are fantastic. I mean, you know, they're, those rods are um, the three weight and the two weight are, I think they stand up to anybody in the industry uh, and, you know, from their rods from, for that application. And um, yeah. Andy suggesting a, a similar thing for reels. That's a good idea. Um, yeah. Let's talk about Clearwater and, and Encounter. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Before our time is up. Clearwater. Um, Clearwater is a great, great, great series. Um, at Orbis, we have with all of our, um, you know, good of the good, better, best category, if you, if you will, all of our good product. Um, we take it pretty seriously. Uh, to basically maximize the performance to price ratio, or the value ratio. And, and Clearwater rods uh, are really a great example of that. Uh, I consider it a handshake. And a lot of times, you know, people who are new to fly fishing or people who are getting, you know, a niche uh, quiver rod, you know, they want to try European nymphing. They don't want to spend a lot of money. So for $198, they get into it. Um, or oh, they want that, a musky rod. They want to, yeah, they want a musky, musky rod. rod. And, you know, they'll go to Clearwater and they'll spend, you know, $249 and be musky fishing with a serious tool. And instead of just, you know, having the name right and having the look right, um, we put a lot in designing those blanks. Uh, and, and to be honest, I'm very proud of all of them. I mean, I, I fish, I fish uh, Clearwater rods, uh, did a lot of two-handed fishing, uh, trout spay fishing and stuff like that with Clearwater rods. And, and um, there really are a, a, just an exceptional value uh, when you think about what you're getting there. And that's whether it's your first rod or your third rod or a new, you know, technique that you want to get into like Euro or Trout Spay. Um, it's, those are really great rods for, for the money. Kip Beef, another one backs me up on the musky rod is very solid. Hi, Kip. Hi, Jen. I saw you there, Jen. Oh, here's a good one. Um, how to choose a line that fits and works makes life a lot easier. Yeah. So talk about the mission rods a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. Mission rods. Uh, so two handed range, the rods uh, all the way from uh, 12 foot six weight up to 15, 10. And those rods we really, I mean, the name mission is really, um, really kind of sums that rod series up. Uh, we wanted to make two-handed rods. We've got a lot of uh, a lot of anglers on our team that um, enjoy swinging flies. You know, whether it's for steelhead or whether it's for trout, bass, or whatever. And um, and so that rod series, we we basically took um, it falls somewhere right in between H3 and Recon, and um, it's just. It's awesome to see uh, the advantages of increased hoop strength and better tracking and damping, having that crisp, clean, fast recovery in a bigger, longer rod is pretty awesome. And, and um, you know, I think that uh, I think from a who and how long were they in development, um, the mission rods, I think the first prototype that we took out and fished was probably in 2000. And six, uh, and we really just didn't want to mess around. We we did uh, instead of bringing in a lot of competitor rods. I mean, one of the things was we make our best race car, and then we go to the track and race. Um, we don't try to sneak behind. And so we did that same thing with Mission, where we worked with our field testers. We worked with the, the internal casters and really kind of honed in on uh, making profiles and load targets um, that would deliver a two-handed cast uh, better than any we've ever made before. And I think um, really kind of puts us in, in the forefront runner uh, with a lot of the two-handed rods on the market, which is a really competitive space to be in. 
Um, and then we we kind of put an Orvis touch to it from a learning standpoint. Um, we developed our own lines with uh, in conjunction with scientific anglers um, with unique tapers for us uh, and unique loads that uh, work with the rods. And so being a rod manufacturer and a line manufacturer and working together there, um, that's made it easier. If you want to swing, you know, soft hackles um, or traditional flies, uh, you can go and grab a sandy head and set it up. And if you want to fish a sink tip for winter steelhead, um, you can get a Skagit head and, and run, you know, uh, 10 foot of T11 or whatever, T12, T14. And that's, that's been, uh, it's been really awesome. I mean, that's, that's been a long road coming uh, down that path and developing those rods. And they've really, they've come out, become really special rods for us. Uh, do you design rods with specific lines? I guess you already answered that one, right? We, we do. Um, yeah, I mean, in just single hand rods, we we design them. Uh, we we'll do two things. We have a set standard line that we'll try our new prototype against the current model, like an H2. Um, so we know same reel, same line. What's the blank doing? What's the rod doing? And then we take in consideration the different applications that people are going to fish. So it takes, for example, the 908 3D. Um, you could have everything from a cold water intermediate line thrown on that to a long belly bonefish, you know, technical presentation line to a bass line. Um, you know, and so we um, that's one of the nicest things about the H3s is a lot of times if you put the wrong line on a rod, so to speak, um, it will – depending on how the line strategy is and what you're casting, it will go in and it'll show up those flat spots and those hinge points and, you know, and the rod won't cast well. Um, the nice thing about H3s is that they'll cast pretty much any line and the rod, really the profile and the loads adjust to the line and the caster so well that I think you and I started calling it autocorrect. Like whatever you do in your back cast, as long as your arm and your eye are looking forward, they're going to, you're going to hit target and the rod's going to do all the work to straighten everything out for you. Wade wants to know if we sell any of these blanks for rod builders. Uh, we have in the past. We typically, um, we typically use uh, mud hole, which is a wholesaler of blanks. And so um, we don't sell them direct um, to consumer as a blank only, but we make them available. I don't believe we sell H3 blanks though, do we? Uh, you know, I'm not that close to the merchandising side at this point. You're just a designer, to. right? You're just a fisherman. Yeah, I'm just a, just a uh, yeah, push my glasses <laughs> up and design rods. Hi, Anita. Oh, Anita didn't have a question, just a thanks. Well, you're welcome, Anita. Good to hear from you. Uh, any chance to bring back the fire and fine taper? Ooh, that's a that's a it's a classic one. Um, we've thought about doing some some throwbacks to uh, not necessarily duping the tapers, but duping some of the cosmetics. And every time we do, you know, we think about that, we kind of get down that wormhole of like, oh, that'd be so cool. And there's something else that's way cooler that comes along. <laughs> um, you know, it's there's never a dull moment. There's never like a you know a, a stop for breath um, when it comes to rod design. And so. Uh, you know, I mean, usually uh, as soon as you get done with one big program, you've already got two in the hopper um, to work on. Uh, you still there? Yeah. 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 I'm here. Uh, travel rods for backpacking. Well, we have, we have, um, of our uh we, we still have frequent flyer right mm. eight piece clear, clear water six piece travel rods so it's in the clear water range um they're six piece not seven so the old frequent flyers were seven piece and and it's it's really funny to me but uh we got a lot of feedback that whenever you break your rods down it's really nice if they're in a even number so that they actually break in half uh, to be stored into a, like a rod reel case or something like that um, instead of, uh, you know, a long section and a short section uh, with a seven piece. And so 
um, you know, we, we made, we played like the two and a half inch compromise to basically make the product, uh, better for moving around, uh, from spot to spot. Would H3 be your top choice if throwing 11, 12 weight sinking for tarp and blind casting? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, the same application with the bigger bug is what I use a lot of, often for uh, musky fishing um, or bigger pike, you know. And so from like a sinking line standpoint, um, the, you know, I use sinking lines, depth charge lines um, in uh, 10 weight, H3 10 weights for striped bass, like, you know, fishing rips and fishing, and busting fish and stuff like that. Um, and so while I personally don't do a lot of sinking, uh, line blind casting for, tarpon, um, those 11 and 12 weights are built for tarpon and they will deliver a sinking line super, super well. He was asking H3. Would H3 yeah. 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 Because of the strength and the lifting power. Yeah. yeah. uh let's see well here's one from mark my h1 five-way tip section angles to the side is that a problem <laughs> uh it doesn't angle to this i mean it depends on how much it angles to the side if it's got a massive amount of set um then that's something that you probably want to contact uh our outfitter team at, at the uh, orbit service center and uh, julia can probably put up a contact there um, for a link mark. Um, but if it's, uh, if it's something where you're looking down in the blank and it's, it looks to be, it's, you know, an eighth of an inch or something like that. If you rotate it and it's barely going like that, that is, uh, that is not going to make a difference, um, so much, but it's definitely one of those things where, uh, from a customer service standpoint, if, you, if it bothers you, it bothers us and we'll fix it. I've never seen a graphite rod with a set. I mean, you some of some of you people know the story that I've had a graphite rod leaning bent in my breezeway for two years now through sub-zero temperatures and 90 degree temperatures. And it's it, and I pick it up every once in a while and I look at it, it's still straight as an arrow. And it's been out in the elements, it's been in the snow and the rain and the heat. And it's still as straight as an arrow when I when I pick it up, but it's leaning with a bend against the wall. I'm going to leave it there, and I fish it every year. I'm going to leave it there, see how long it uh, lasts. The cork is very bleached, but yeah. uh, and the real seat's kind of bleached. But other than that, it's well. I have a, a I have a setup at my house where I I um, leave my rods strong and and everything. I mean, I'm kind of notorious for having probably too many rods ready to go um, at any time. And so I, you know, some of them they'll sit there with sag. They don't really get set. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you're such a great person to fish with because if I don't have the right rod, you always got it somewhere in your truck. Somewhere. Yep. If you could just get me to start reeling right hand then we'd be set. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get you to reel on the right side. And you're not getting that trout spay outfit back either, by the way. I'm keeping oh, it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm keeping it. <laughs> it's got an Odyssey on it. That's such a sweet setup, by the way. I know. Uh, sorry for partying, Tom. It's mine. You, you got to come and get it. And I'm under quarantine here. You can't come in my yard. You're right. You're right. I'm not under any more quarantine than anybody else, by the way. Fine. Any plans to reintroduce the Orvis CFO reels? That's so funny. Uh, you guys should ask that because uh, on my desk, I have uh, a CFO 6, which is a full cage, um, just sitting here for inspiration. And, uh, you know, part of, uh, yeah, part of the whole strategy. You could sell that on eBay for a lot of money, you know. No, uh, that's uh, you. You could the uh, <laughs> uh, those those were only manufactured. That specific CFO was only manufactured for maybe uh, six years in total. Um, so there's not a tremendous amount of them out there, but it's it's a really fun reel. But um, to answer your question, uh, it it would be awesome 
of me and Orvis um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the CFO, um, which is next Christmas. It was 1971 that we sold in the Christmas holiday catalog with Santa on the top, on the front, the first CFO reel. And uh, so, yeah, 50th anniversary is a good chance. What do you think, Tom? Should we do it? Is that a little foreshadowing there? Maybe. I mean, if you if you give me the go ahead, then then sure. We're hey, um, the great the great um, Vermont angler and fishing buddy of ours, Ben Shaftesbury, um, wants to know what do you say to people who complain about the H three white butt section? <laughs> I say, uh, I say get over it. <laughs> yeah, I you know I. Um, I don't know. It's funny. Uh, at first, uh, that was like the the only thing people could talk about, you know, when they would, oh, it's a cool new rod and it casts so great. Man, I was fishing. It's awesome. Um, what, what, uh, what about that white thing? You know, what is that? And, um, you know, I, I just, yeah, I mean, Tom says get over it. Uh, I say that it's a fishing tool and, um, that I've, I've found my rods after, uh, relieving myself uh stream side and the weeds uh, pick it up because i can see it and you know i used to lose rods and now now there's a white section sitting in the grass and so i can see them but um no i don't i don't know the hook keeper is the same thing um uh it's you know if you put the the for the for the record for the absolute record right on the hook keeper uh because that seems to be the best topic and we'll yeah. go ahead. The reason why uh, the the hook keeper was removed from the rods fundamentally is because on a nine foot rod, when you store a dry fly on the hook keeper, your your nine foot leader or your twelve foot leader to fly line connection that knot goes into the tip top, and when you move to the next place, you take your fly off and you uh, you pull your fly out. You have to do this silly little like kind of dance where you're trying to get the line you know and the the knot to pass through the tip top and a lot of our breakages come from getting hung up there and clients going you know guide or or just anglers going oh man you know i've got this rising fish in this spot and they're filling around with it and so by taking the hook keeper off um and putting radius foots on reels like uh this mirage having that radius foot there uh, allows you to do what you should do is keep the knot out of the tip top, hook the fly on one of the conveniently uh, located guides that are also hook keepers and then run your leader behind that foot. Um, so it won't kink and then you'll be ready to go. I mean, you know, it's, it's a simple operation. Um, and from a design philosophy standpoint, uh, we decided that instead of telling people, don't put their hand in the cookie jar. We just got rid of the cookie jar. Well, it's the, the line gets caught on it once in a while too. Line gets caught. Yeah, on. Half, half the population haven't had a hook keeper on a saltwater rod for thirty years. So, if people really want a hook keeper, they can buy a spool of thread and um, buy a hook keeper and wind one on. It's not that hard, <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. I yeah, I don't understand. And you know, you said dry fly, but with indicator rigs too, you don't. You mean you often you almost always have a a leader longer than nine feet. If you don't, yeah, especially on shorter rods. I mean, you yeah, know, eight yeah. Halves. Um, and you know, the indicator thing is, you know, that's where people got used to putting their, you know, their their fly on about halfway up the rod keeping the bobber out of the tip top and running behind uh, all those things are, uh, you know, that's a, those are all reasons not to have a hook keeper. So it's really interesting. I mean, a lot of people, you know, have asked me that and they think it's to save money or something like that. And it's, it's really not the cost is insignificant. It's more of a making the right tool. It's the same reason that a lot of cars don't have, um, you know, key slots on the doors uh, to push, you know, push in. And it's just like, how many times has the monster been chasing you and you can't get your key into the slot to open up the, 
door on your 67 Nova, you know, so taking that and making a keyless entry and just making it where, you know, you can't screw it up and you can't break your tip tops and stuff like that is, is really that an analogy number six. Is that an analogy? Uh, probably 12, Tom? I snuck yeah. a few in there. Yeah. Uh, what about the future for super fine glass? A couple questions about four, four piece fiberglass and then what's next for the super fine glass. Um, yeah. So the, the, uh, Four piece super fine glass um, is something that we thought about. And the reason why we did three piece on the glass rods is because, um, well, we, you know, <laughs> contrary to the graphite side of things, glass is pretty soft and, uh, and it doesn't build load that fast. And so uh, having, having less sections to kind of spread out uh, those profiles was a little bit more advantageous You'll notice that when we get in the longer rods, um, say at the eight and a half foot six weight and the triple eight, the eight and a, eight foot eight inch eight weight, we do them in four piece. We thought about updating, or no, I wouldn't say updating, but re reintroducing the super fine glass and taking some of the three piece models. But those rods are so sweet the way they are. Um, I don't know. It'd be really hard for me to change it. Uh, any plans to resurrect the hydros rods? Uh, no. <laughs> there, no. You can do better, right? No. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, no. no rods get better with every evolution, and, and we don't we don't want to go backwards. Uh, Ty wants to know uh, uh, who drew the picture behind me, and uh, Ty, I drew that with my kids on. You did not. Art challenge on Instagram that I, I, I did draw. This. Really? And then I put it up there because my. Yeah, That's yeah, good. yeah, I drew that. I didn't realize you were so talented. Oh, wow. thank you, Mom. See, he's tipping on a little. Yeah. Uh, I, channeled, I channeled my inner. Uh, my inner uh, childhood. I used to draw a lot. Oh, that's nice. Now we draw I, one for uh, me. Uh, I'll give that one to you. I'll frame uh, it. I'll, I'll, I'll swap you for some chocolate. Yeah, that sounds good. Any other, are there, we have any other questions here? We've gone over an hour. I don't know what our. No, this is awesome. I'm uh, having fun with it. I mean, yeah. any, uh, anything, uh, anything that we missed? Anything we Somebody missed? said there's a blue, there's a blue H3 on the website. Do we have those out now? Uh, those are going to be in stock very soon. Um, yeah, why don't, you talk are, about, why don't you talk about those? Well, I hit it. I hit it a little bit earlier, but we basically, because of the artist series and the feedback we got with the uh, with the um, the colored label area, if you will, uh, kind of turning the lights on and putting some color where that white section is, we um, we basically decided that for the 905F, the 905D. The 906D and 908D um, that we would do olive and blue labels. Um, pretty cool. They're pretty awesome. They're fun. Um, uh, and, you know, it's kind of it's fun to to just sort of have um, have a little difference there, a little zing, if you will. Do you guys sell anything comparable to the frequent flyer rod? Yeah, we yeah Lee, we just yeah uh, clear, mentioned clear the six piece, piece. Clearwater six piece. Mm -hmm. Yep. Our bass rod. Mine is Recon Seven Foot Eleven. Yeah, those are. Uh, that's actually uh, Seven Eleven or Great Rod series um, that we did uh, probably four years ago. Um, they're really awesome for throwing poppers and stuff like that. We did them at eight, nine, and ten. Um, not a lot of people really got onto them, uh, but they're pretty awesome. My favorite bass rod these days is the Triple Eight Superfine Glass. The eight foot eight inch eight weight. Um, I just feel like that, you know, throws a throws a big heavy popper, you know, a big air air resistant popper really well, um, and they're a lot of fun when you hook up. You know, bass are acrobatic and just a lot of wiggle going on there. I really enjoy that rod. Tony has asked twice the future of Orvis bamboo rods. That's a good question. Uh, we we're making bamboo rods now. Um, Charlie Heisey retired this year, uh, actually into last year. And uh, 
and we have been looking for someone to replace the big shoes that uh, that he had. And um, and you know, from a development standpoint, uh, we're pretty happy with the rods that we offer now in the 1856, the Penns Creek, and the Adirondack. And um, you know, I don't I don't know that we'll be developing any new tapers. Um, we sort of pulled a lot of stops on the 1856. That's an awesome eight foot five weight kind of a Western trout rod, um, you know, for in bamboo. It's a pretty fun rod to fish. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's uh, currently we're, well, the rod shop was unfortunately uh, shut down at the moment. Um, like many things are a uh, small compromise for a bigger cause, but, but uh, we're still, we're still cutting bamboo up and making rods. I want a two weight bamboo. Not a three. You want a two? You want to go straight to two? About two or three. Yeah. I want a lighter bamboo. I love my Pence Creek. Yeah. Uh, Keith wants to know: Do you uh, you used to do a seven ninety five? Any plans on bringing that rod size back? Um, and at the moment, um, we don't. Uh, I, you know, actually, Tom and I had dinner with Joe Humphreys in January. I think it was January, and uh, that was his uh, bushwhacker rod, the 795, and told me a really good story about fishing that length and rods on the bat and kill uh, a long time ago. And so it kind of inspired me to to think about it. Um, you know, that rod sort of lost uh, lost fame, I'd say probably 10 years ago, just from the number of people who were fishing them and, and purchasing them. So, but it is a it's a very good application and good tool um, for the right application of fishing tight quarters and uh, with bigger flies, you know, trout and stuff. Can I tell a story about the seven, nine far and fine? Yeah. So here's a story. This is the way rods used to get designed a long time ago. When we first sold graphite rods, the, um, guy who was running the rod shop came to some of us and said, what do you think of this new rod? It's a five weight, seven foot, nine inch. And we cast them and said, wow, this is amazing. This, this thing is really cool. And it was a, for its time, it was a really great rod. How, how'd you design this? He said, I took a seven and a half foot butt section and I put an eight foot tip on it. <laughs> that is the God's honest truth. That's how that famous fire and fine came out. It was total serendipity. It was, it was, it was a, it was a, it was total, total, um, you know, it just happened to work, but you know, it just, it could very well have not worked at all, but that's yeah. how fire and fine came about. <laughs> he, well, it makes sense now, you know, it, <laughs> fine tip and it had a far reaching butt section. You yeah. Know? yeah. 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 I love that's it. Funny. Maybe. Maybe we should do an old far and fine with a 3F tip section and a 3D butt section. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See how big of an inch we get in the middle of it. That sounds good. <laughs> oh, the stories I could tell about the old days. <laughs> Speaking of bamboo rods, Tom, have you ever thought about interviewing Gloria Jordan? No, I haven't. Good idea. Yeah. Uh, we already talked about selling H3 blanks. What's next? What's next in terms of rod technology? That's that's the tough yeah. one. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I I, uh, I ask my myself that question every day. Um, you know, without giving anything away, I I think that uh, I think we're pretty due for. I mean, you know, we have every year or every five years or whatever, you know, every time we roll out a new rod series, people are like, wow, I couldn't believe that, you know, your team was able to make a better rod than the H1, you know, the Helios. And then a la H2 is there, uh, you know, and then we set the guide rendezvous and I, you know, I send surveys out and uh, we, you know, have endless conversations of what's wrong with H2 and what do we need to fix and what can we do and how do we make it better? And then we, we work on that and kind of dig deep and do a lot of really fun, explore, you know, explore and research and development and engineering. And, and, uh, we come up with H3, you know, and, 
and people are like, wow, you know, this is the best rod ever. And that's awesome. Uh, but if from a continuous improvement standpoint, we really, we really never slow down. Uh, and I think, I think that uh, it's just getting harder and harder to, to sort of put, put a good distance uh, from a performance standpoint on some of, you know, some of our more recent rods, but, um, but it's a, it's a full-time job and that's what we, that's what we do. So I don't want to give anything away, um, but we're working and our sites are set on, you know, our, that's, I mentioned it earlier, we don't buy a bunch of competitors rods and, you know, cast them all and measure them all and do all that. We, uh, we, we just look at our rod and go, how do we make a better Orvis rod? And I think that's well, what we're so we are, we, we look at competitive rods. What do you we don't, no, so I used the analogy earlier is we don't, we don't, uh, we build our best race car and go to the track for on race day. Yeah. And, yeah. And, we, and at that point, in order to, you know, once we've internally uh, fished and cast and field tested rods, um, then we go to the internal casting committee, which is, Simon Perkins, Charlie Perkins, Bill Reed, Pete Kutzer, uh, myself, Dave Perkins, and uh, we get the rod blessed, if you will, or approved. Where we do, you know, um, we have we everybody has their smartphone and they fill out a survey on how accurate the rod is at 25 feet, 45 feet, 75 feet. How's its distance casting? How's its swing weight? You know, and so we we're getting all that feedback individually as they're casting the rods. And then once a rod is blessed as being, yep, that's we're going to sell this rod. Um, then we bring the competitive landscape in um, so that we can talk to our rep for it and we can talk to the fishing managers, you know, and guys like yourself can fish and cast it against uh, some of our competitors. So um, that's that's where I was kind of heading down that that kind of path of, you know, we build Orbis rods um, to be better than Orbis rods. And I think it's working for us from staying focused on competing against ourselves and continuously improving it. What about our official cork? Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, so we do use uh, composite cork, which is a, a blend um, for kind of high wear areas that you'll see on the butt sections and stuff like that. Um, and we have veered away from foam or things like that, but uh, it's definitely something that, that I'm always interested in sort of looking at other technologies and adjacent industries and seeing how they're handling, uh, you know, the human interaction between a tool and their hand for, you know, things like shock absorption, uh, less fatigue, better ergonomics and stuff like that. So we're always looking, but we haven't been quick to chase, um, you know, that because if, boy, I'll tell you right now, if you think that we got a lot of shit for, pulling a hook keeper off if we if we ditch a cork handle uh, and put some you know, uh, you know foam or something like that on there who knows what who knows what they'll say well there's some pretty good substitutes out there that that are really durable and light but i i just don't don't think the consumer will accept a non-cork grip <laughs> rod at this point yeah cork has people a lot have, of people, uh, have, people have come out with them and they haven't done very well not us, but other. No, people. they've come and gone. Yeah, they've come and gone. I mean, you know, like foam gets really, um, I would call squishy and slippery, and you lose a lot of control. Uh, cork, cork is a is a really good natural material um, from that standpoint. So maybe we need a screw top handle to replace cork. I have no idea what you're talking about. Screw top, you know, like wines have screw tops. Oh, 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 yeah. You no, know, yeah, you're yeah. not a wine drinker, so. I'm not a wine drinker. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, My brother grew up with cork. Are there still issues with high grade cork? Issues with high grade cork, as far yeah, as getting uh, getting high grade cork. Uh, no, you know, we have a really good. I mean, we've got you know uh, our cork suppliers. Um, we've had a really great relationship with them, and they. They source uh, and and own um, the factories, uh, you know, the farms. Really, it's not really a factory, but a farm um, for their raw material from Spain or from Portugal, and and so there's not 
we don't we don't have an issue. There may be on a global market, uh, it may be uh, tougher and tougher um, to to find good high court gray cork, but we're really confident that we have some really nice cork. Well, Jim LePage went to Portugal years ago and I think did a lot of legwork in, in making sure that we had a consistent supply. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been like 20, almost 25 years ago. What materials, what materials are, oh, Sean Brilliant says, I love wine. Hi, Sean. <laughs> what materials? I say I love Sean Brilliant. What's up, buddy? <laughs> What ma new materials are rod makers experimenting with? Is graphite in one form or another the best we can hope for? What do you think? Graphene. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, graphene, yeah, so there's graphene, which uh, graphene is uh, a really cool marketing buzzword. Um, we've been tracking graphene from its inception, uh, which was basically kind of turn of the century. Uh, a couple guys, Cambridge University, uh, got a Pulitzer Prize for making a little s square of graphene and uh, claiming that it was the a single atom structure that's the strongest uh, strength to weight ratio product or material ever made. Um, its scalability has been uh, challenged in that sheet form, uh, which is how we build rods. And so what you're seeing now is um, products, whether it's a tennis racket or a ski, um, you know, general sporting good, I'd say high, higher end luxury products that claim to have graphene. Um, they have a really a graphene powder additive in the resin system. Um, and we have we have looked at that. We've talked to our suppliers. Um, it, it's not that is not in the form. It's got the name, but not the product. And mm. so, uh, you know, I think that uh, what we have to realize in our industry is that most of the material advancements uh, happened 30 years prior and they trickle through defense and aerospace into the commercial world, um, you know, for consumable sporting goods and, and things like that. So um, it's a, it's a long pathway uh, before a, a new material gets into, um, gets into, you know, a carbon fiber mountain bike or road bike or skis or fly rod. Um, and so it's really interesting, you know, a lot of people they'll they'll read a science journal and they'll call me up and they'll go, oh, you know, man, this new graphene, it seems great. And we're not Guilty. a naysayer. Guilty. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not a naysayer. It's just uh, <laughs> when it has the scalability and commercial viability uh, to make it into our hands, um, we will be ready and, uh, you know, to start experimenting with it as we have done, uh, but it's just not, in, unless we start fishing with, uh, you know, seven centimeter fly rods, um, it's just not there yet. And, and as far as other things, we've seen a lot of advancements in resin technology. Um, we've seen less advancements in fiber packages, and we're really proud of H3 of having, um, we basically are buying our uh, our carbon fiber resin um, packages, our material packages, we're buying that out of the uh, industrial side of the supply chain, not the commercial side. And that's that means that we have such a great relationship with our suppliers that they are letting us purchase what's going in, you know, Boeing airplanes and uh, Black Hawk helicopters not what's going in Bauer hockey sticks and, uh, you know, Berkeley casting rods and stuff like that. So, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that make Orbis fly rods great. There's heritage, there's history. Um, there's the team we get to work with. There's uh, the expertise in the rod shop with crafting, you know, fly rods from the fit and finish. Um, and then there's the, there's the cutting edge innovation that uh, a lot of it we can't, you know, we can't even really talk about just from a trade secret standpoint. And I know that that often seems like, um, you know, like, well, they're, they're hiding behind something. But in, in a hyper competitive market of fly rods, uh, the anglers have a lot of choices and a lot of people have chosen H3s uh, because of their merits. And, you know, we appreciate that. And I think it speaks for itself. You know, that's why you see so many of them in use. 
Hey, why don't we put rod weights, physical weights, on the blanks any longer? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I think that uh, physical weights, there there was a point where, where we were chasing physical weight to make the world's lightest rod as an industry. And we got to a, a plateau. And it really, you know, uh, having 2.38 ounces or 2.4 ounces or two and a half ounces really didn't make a difference in how the rod cast. Um, and, it, you know, it's no different than, uh, you know, same reason why a Ford Mustang doesn't say, you know, 433 horsepower on the back of it. Um, 13. You know, the proof's 13, in the book. 13 and That's out. 14. Oh, 14. 14. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got my analogy quicker over here, Tom. <laughs> well, you used one but, twice. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, I mean, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. We get that a lot. Um, we just don't think it is as important as it once was in making a selection, it's sort of confusing. Do I need the lightest rod? Do I, you know, all that stuff there, like fly rods are light. Um, and, and they, it's, you know, it's more about the performance and uh, it's more about the swing weight and how, how they fish with um, what they do for an angler. Yeah, I love Brian Reed said light, cheap, strong, pick two. Yeah. Um, that's the engineer's triangle that, that I've spoken to earlier. And uh, really, that is true. And what we do every day is we make, um, you know, the, the best rods that we can make uh, for the money and all of our price points uh, where we don't compromise on durability and we don't compromise on casting performance um, for the given price point. The other one, uh, do we anticipate COVID-19 upsetting supply chain? I, um, I, I think that COVID-19, you know, the, the pandemic is, is uh, something that's really scary to even talk about. I would be less concerned about our supply chain and more, I'd say, concerned about the uh, independent shops, the guides, the people you went fishing with last year um, who you wanted to go fish with this year who are sitting at home right now. Um, that's where, that's where I am worried about them. Right, Tom? Yep. Is there, is there rod weight information anywhere on the site? Um, no, I don't think it, I don't really don't think it is. Um, uh, I think Keith, if you contact the, OSC, Keith, if you, yeah, if you contact, um, our, uh, our tech line or our outfitters uh, service down in Roanoke on the toll free line or on chat, they'll be able to give you rod weights. I'm sure they have it. Yeah. Just not a, a factor anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's no different than, uh, yeah. I don't, well, I'm not even, I'm not going to use 14 on that. <laughs> Well, Sean, we've uh, we've wasted another hour and a half of people's time, as the car talk guys used to say. Yeah, and we're not as funny. I'm going to answer one, one last question, uh, which is any love for the H4 question from Alex? Alex, uh, H4 will happen, and uh, and long story short, uh, when it does happen, we'll have another one of these Facebook lives to talk about it. Um, but I, that's, uh, that's as much love as I can give you for H4 right now. We're really <laughs> happy with H3. They're great rods. Uh, I wake up every morning wondering how we can make better rods, but I know that, uh, I know it's a worthy cause to, to not rest, um, and to always, always tinker, always use your imagination and try to be innovative and solve problems in different ways. Well, thank you everyone for listening today. Thank you for your patience and your great questions. Really, really good questions. Um, you know, if you, if you ever have, if you're ever trying to decide what rod to buy, we have the outfitter service uh, that you can call or go online and chat and, and that's what they do all day long. They're anglers just like us. They know the rod line really well. And if you're, if you're ever in doubt on whether you should buy a Clearwater or an Encounter or a Recon or what length and line size you need, 
it's a it's a great place to go and they will they will take all the time you need to help you decide um, which rod you want do you have any parting words mr combs no just uh thanks everybody for support spending time with us uh thanks for fishing orbis rods it means a lot to the team Bye, Kip. Bye, Sean. See you guys. Not you, Sean. The other Sean. Sean Brilliant.